Thanks, Daron. Welcome, everyone, to uh, another fun-filled morning. Um, so I was given this topic uh, assigned to me, the sporting spine. And I must admit, I was a little bit unsure what to do. Uh, I, I could have been brave and maybe a little crazy like Dr Mason a couple of years ago and tried to tell a thousand physios how to treat back pain, but uh, I, I wasn't quite there. Um, and Andreas, unfortunately, took the disc, so I was starting to run out of topics. Uh, and then I had what I'll describe as my Movember inspiration. Dennis Keith Lilly. So for all the millennials here, and they're probably at the webinar because they don't like to go out, but all the old people probably still like to come to lecture theatres, um, just a little bit of a history lesson. My kids don't, they, nothing history is important. Nah, Dad, it's not important to whatever's happening now. Um, but a lot of things happened before the year 2000. Uh, <laughs> And as a child of the 70s, I, I grew up idolising Dennis Keith. Uh, back in the days where men were real men, they grew moustaches as a statement, not as a uh, charity for a month. Uh, and they were allowed to have chest hair and certainly not afraid to show it off. Uh, so Dennis Keith was probably one of the first profile examples of lumbar stress injuries. So he had a tremendous start to his cricketing career uh, but then it all came crashing down when he was diagnosed with career-threatening stress fractures in 1973. Uh, and it took him 12 months. He went into a full-body plaster cast uh, and he did an intensive rehabilitation program under a sports scientist back in the days where there weren't a thousand exercise and sports uh, uh, science students coming off the, the treadmill every year, uh, a fellow by the name of Frank Pike. And a lot of the work they did with Dennis actually really makes a lot of the groundwork for how we treat stress fractures nowadays. Of course, it's well known that he came back and terrorised the Poms with, uh, with his great mate Jeff Thompson and then went on to take a world record 355 test wickets. So for all the millennials, Dennis Keith Lilly. So pars intraarticularis injury. Now, when I first started in sports medicine, this always confused me. There's all these terms, spondylosis, pars defects, stress fractures, spondylolisthesis. I could never quite get my head around it. So... What I'll hopefully give you today is a little bit of a framework for how I would approach this problem. Uh, so spondylosis by definition is a defect of the bony neural arch around the pars intraarticularis. So the area where those arrows are pointing on the CAT scan. And there's a spectrum, basically from acute to chronic, and chronic includes pars defects, which is a slightly different uh, entity. And it's a continuum from bone stress to actual bony defect. And one of the concepts I use with patients, which seems to work for me, is the ice cream container theory. So when you get your ice cream container and you bend it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, first thing you get is the white line. And then as you keep bending it back and forth, back and forth, it starts to crack and break apart. So that most patients seem to get that idea that if you get them at the white line stage, it's better than when you're at the crack phase. Um, most common in the L5 region, the majority, uh, and then as we go up the spine, little, uh, a lot less common in L4 and then the other levels above that. Now, we know younger ad and adolescent athletes, back pain is common. Somewhere between 30 to 50% of adolescent athletes will describe back pain. And we always must consider stress injury when the back pain is not resolving. And also when they involve, are involved in sports that involve extension, such as gymnastics, cricket fast bowling, and also just generally active teenagers. So just kids who are getting a bit bigger, playing sport with running and direction change, who develop back pain. Another question that always bugged me was, why, why, why do only adolescents get this problem? And the main reason is that the neural arch is quite vulnerable at this time. And anyone here who's had teenagers or got teenagers, I've got a, a few at the moment, is that they grow really quickly. Uh, and by the time they're almost as big as me, which is not hard, like John McGreen, um, they've really only got about 60% of their peak bone mass. So really there's incomplete ossification of the bone in this area and that really doesn't occur fully till they're in their, or till people are in their mid-twenties. One of the reasons why we don't really tend to see stress fractures in the older fast bowler unless they have had a chronic defect from their youth that wasn't well managed. Uh, also at this age there is increased elasticity of the disc which allows more stress to be put on the neural arch. And then as a last point, adolescents, they're getting bigger, they're getting stronger, they're playing harder sport, they're just putting more load on their backs in general. One point to take home, and I like axioms, this is my axiom with adolescents with back pain is that they have a stress fracture until proven otherwise. Bit easier for me because I'll usually see them when they've had pain for a while, 
maybe not quite so easy for you, but I think if you've treated for a while and they're not improving, you should always consider that. If in addition the pain is unilateral, it's worse with extension, they play sport that involves extension, it worsens with activity, improves with rest, and is not resolving with appropriate therapy under your guidance, you should always consider lumbar stress injuries. It's just so common. From an examination point of view, they typically will have pain that's provoked with extension. Uh, the picture on the screen there, thanks Nathan Cooper, one of your fellow physios, uh, is a stalk test, which is a unilateral extension. You can put a bit of rotation on it as well to try and load the pars up uh, a little further. Um, obviously, abnormalities with lumbopelvic stability uh, and also pain on unila unilateral palpation. Uh, lastly, there are some associations with morphological features such as hyperpronation, general skeletal immaturity and hyperlordosis and even scoliosis. Uh, imaging, I've again come from a bit of an old school background, so I typically uh, would go with bone scan to diagnose my stress fractures. Um, preaching to the converted here, but a plain x-ray is never a bad idea. The only trouble with stress fracture is to do it properly is you do need to have oblique views and the actual radiation dose is probably similar to obtaining a CAT scan of the lumbar spine. So what we're looking for there on the, on the x-rays and on the oblique views is the, the classic Scotty dog with a collar that you can see on the yellow arrow. Uh, bone scanning historically has been the gold standard for diagnosing uh, uh, stress fractures. That is a very sensitive way of finding bony pathology and in combination with a CT to make it a spec CT uh, we can actually see a little bit more structurally what's happening with the bone there. Plain CT is much much better than any other modality for looking at bone defects and maybe a more sensitive way of determining whether there's some early bone, um, uh, bone basically crack or loss. Uh, but I guess the, the gold standard at the moment seems to be MRI scanning. Papers now are suggesting that it has at least uh, equal efficacy to bone scanning in diagnosing stress fractures. And there are some newer sequences. So this one called the T1 Vibe sequences seems to be the best, um, the best sequence for diagnosing a lumbar stress fracture. So if you are in the position where you're seeing someone with an MRI scan, it's important that they've had the Vibe sequence and the, the scanner that you use has this. So what are our goals for treatment? Really the main outcome is to try and heal this as possible. A healed bone is better than a not healed bone. Uh, and there was a really nice study done by a Japanese group quite a few years ago now where they looked at the pictures there. We have the first pictures, what they'd call an early stress fracture. The middle pictures are progressive and the last one is a terminal stress fracture. So you can see it's widened, there's sclerosis and also some cystic change. And they found that if we pick the stress fractures up early enough, even if there was a, some bony defect, that you had a three in four chance of them healing if they were treated appropriately. Um, more progressive lesions, it goes down to less than half. And if they're terminal lesions, which we may see uh, as a pars defect, uh, then there's basically no chance of them healing. So that's not your goal. You're trying to get their pain better, but you're not necessarily wanting their bone to heal. Um, unilateral lesions heal more readily than bilateral. Uh, and the last point there, early, early diagnosis, if we get them at the white line, it's better than we get them when the, the plastic's uh, ripped apart. So how should we treat these patients? Well, rest. I love treating anything where you can tell people to rest for three months and they're almost invariably going to get better. Uh, and the, the outcomes are favourable. Most of the literature would suggest by appropriate rest and rehabilitation, you should get upwards of 80 to 90% of improvement. Um, how long should they rest? I think it's sometimes different for different uh, people and conditions, but I think as a general rule, it seems to be about three months. And not uncommonly, if if um, the athlete does come back before that, they do have a risk of recurrence of their stress injury. And that begs the question, should they have some sort of follow-up imaging? I know Cricket Australia now with their elite fast bowlers um, will definitely do follow-up MRI scans. And it seems that the bone marrow edema starts to resolve at around about 12 to 14 weeks, which is reflective of a three-month rest period. Um, Again, CT scanning, I, I think, can be helpful when you're looking to see if there's actually any true bony defect, which may alter your management. The last question is, should we brace? And I think this is always one that comes up. And the Americans, they love bracing. Everyone, I think they like devices, something that you can put a patient in and show them that you're doing a good job. Um, and really, in Australia, we don't tend to, to brace the stress fractures. Uh, I've braced one person in 22 years. Um, 
most people get better and they don't seem to require bracing. It's only used more if they have, I guess, more severe or maybe recalcitrant pain. That was the only time I, I had to use that. Um, obviously, avoid extension activity, so you want them to be pain-free if possible. Uh, physiotherapy is essential. You need to uh, address soft tissue issues and start a lumbopelvic rehabilitation program. And then I think cross-training, avoiding extension position. So I'm more than happy with exercise, bike. Swimming is a bit of an extended position, so I think early on, no, but as they start to progress, then swimming can be brought in. Uh, a point about fast bowlers because this is very, very topical and lots and lots of work have been, has been done on this and it, it becomes controversial. They have Jeff Lawson saying, you know, we're not bowling enough and you have all the sports scientists saying, well, you know, you're bowling too much. I think the main point is that you don't want to have too much overload, but you also don't want to have underload because underload doesn't help to prepare the, that area of your back to take load. So the consensus at the moment seems to be somewhere between 30 to 40 deliveries a day is ideal, and it is better if you do not bowl on consecutive days, so to have a rest day in between bowling. So bowling somewhere between two to three times a week. With respect to technique, the main technique issue is usually a, a mixed action, so where they have counter-rotation between the shoulders and the hips. Fast bowler should ideally be a front-on technique or a side-on technique. Um, so it's important if you're bringing particularly a good level fast bowler back after lumbar stress injuries that they have some sort of a biomechanical analysis with a coach who's familiar with, uh, with this problem. I should mention um, PARS defects. Uh, these are not in truth a congenital problem, but they certainly develop early in childhood. So um, usually within the first 12 months of life, um, there's a very high familial predisposition to PARS defects, so around about 50% of Eskimos have them. Um, it's a common problem, about 4% or 1 in 25% of the population, and often uh, the patient's unaware that they have this problem until they maybe develop some mechanical lower back pain later in life and someone does an x-ray uh, and, and they're diagnosed. Uh, although in adolescence, again, they can be aggravated by extension sports such as gymnastics and cricket fast bowling, and they may or may not be related to a spondylolisthesis. So if you ever do an x-ray and um, your patient has a spondylolisthesis, then by definition they must have bilateral PARS defects. Um, so the treatment of the PARS defects is more about trying to get their back to settle down, not so much about trying to get the PARS defect to heal. So the amount of rest may be a shorter period. Um, and again, physio and rehabilitation is essential. In the majority of cases, a grade one to two spondylolisthesis, which is less than 50% overlap of the L5 on the S1, should settle down. Although if it's any more than that, I'd certainly be sending them off for a surgical opinion. Uh, it's not unreasonable in adolescence to do a check x-ray every six to 12 months to make sure that there's no progression. Although the progression rate is apparently relatively low. Uh, surgery is seldom required for stress injuries um, and this again is not my area of expertise but we obviously have some excellent spinal surgeons at Orthosports uh, but brought in when there's been a failure of conservative management um, generally it involves some sort of stabilisation procedure uh, minimally invasive surgery has been uh, suggested although typically it may be something like a pedicle screw and some bone graft or even a standard lumbar fusion. But uh, Andreas can certainly tell us a lot more about that. So, take home messages. Lower back pain is common in adolescents, but you must always consider the lower back pain in that athlete if it is not getting better with appropriate treatment and if they play high risk sports. All adolescents have a lumbar stress fracture until proven otherwise when they present with lower back pain. Uh, most will settle with appropriate periods of rest and rehabilitation uh, and prevention involves load monitoring, technique optimisation, uh, especially with cricket fast bowlers. Um, now I didn't have any nice pictures of, uh, of Southeast Asian um, temples, thank you, that's the word I was after, but uh, again for the millennials this is uh, Fatso the Fat Ass Wombat, was the uh, unofficial mascot of the 2000 Sydney Olympics. Uh, and that tells me I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you.